Lines 433 to 434 to the sea which we had visited in 33. In 1933, Prince Charles was 18 and Disa, Duchess of Payne, 5. The allusion is to Nice, see also line 240, where the shades spent the first part of that year. But here again, as in regard to so many fascinating facets of my friend's past life, I am not in the possession of particulars. Who is to blame, dear SS? And not in the position to say whether or not, in the course of possible excursions along the coast, they ever reached Cap Turk and glimpsed from an oleander lined lane, usually open to tourists, the Italianate villa built by Queen Dissa's grandfather in 1908 and called then Villa Paradisa, or in Zemblin, Villa Paradisa, later to forego the first half of its name in honor of his favorite granddaughter. There she spent the first 15 summers of her life. Thither did she return in 1953, quote, for reasons of health, end of quote, as impressed on the nation, but really a banished queen, and there she still dwells. When the Zemblin Revolution broke out, May 1st, 1958, she wrote the king a wild letter in governess English, urging him to come and stay with her until the situation cleared up. The letter was intercepted by the Anhava police, translated into crude Zemblin by a Hindu member of the extremist party, and then read aloud to the royal captive in a would-be ironic voice by the preposterous commandant of the palace. There happened to be in that letter one, only one, thank God, sentimental sentence, quote, I want you to know that no matter how much you hurt me, you cannot hurt my love, end of quote. And this sentence, if we re-English it from the Zemblin, came out as, quote, I desire you and love when you flog me, end of quote. He interrupted the commandant, calling him a buffoon and a rogue and insulting everybody around so dreadfully that the extremists had to decide fast whether to shoot him at once or let him have the original of the letter. Eventually, he managed to inform her that he was confined to the palace. Valiant, Dissa hurriedly left the Riviera and made a romantic but fortunately ineffectual attempt to return to Zimbla. Had she been permitted to land, she would have been forthwith incarcerated, which would have reacted on the king's flight doubling the difficulties of escape. A message from the Carlists containing these simple considerations checked her progress in Stockholm, and she flew back to her perch in a mood of frustration and fury, mainly, I think, because the message had been conveyed to her by a cousin of hers, good only Curdy Buff, good old Curdy Buff, whom she loathed. Several weeks passed, and she was soon in a state of even worse agitation owing to rumors that her husband might be condemned to death. She left Cap Turk again. She had traveled to Brussels and chartered a plane to fly north. When another message, this time from Odon, came, saying that the king and he were out of Zimbla, and that she should quietly regain Villa Dissa and await their further news. In the autumn of the same year, she was informed by Lavender that a man representing her husband would be coming to discuss with her certain business matters concerning property she and her husband jointly owned abroad. She was in the act of writing on the terrace under the jacaranda a disconsolate letter to Lavender when the tall, sheared, and bearded visitor with the bouquet of flowers of the gods who had been watching her from afar advanced through the garlands of shade. She looked up, and of course no dark spectacles and no makeup could for a moment fool her. Since her final departure from Zembla, he had visited her twice. The last time, two years before. And during that lapse of time, her pale skin, dark hair, beauty had acquired a new, mature, and melancholy glow. In Zimbla, where most females are freckled blondes, we have the saying, Bell with Iverkumpf vid snu ebenumpf. Quote, a beautiful woman should be like a compass rose of ivory with four parts of ebony, end of quote. And this was the trim scheme nature had followed in Dissa's case.
There was something else, something I was to realize only when I read Pale Fire, or rather reread it after the first bitter hot mist of disappointment had cleared before my eyes. I am thinking of lines 261 to 267, in which Shade describes his wife. At the moment of his painting that poetical portrait, the sitter was twice the age of Queen Vissa. I do not wish to be vulgar in dealing with these delicate matters, but the fact remains that 60-year-old Shade is lending here a well-conserved coval, the ethereal and eternal aspect she retains. Or should retain in his kind, noble heart. Now, the curious thing about it is that Disa at 30, when last seen in September 1958, bore a singular resemblance not, of course, to Mrs. Shade, as she was when I met her, but to the idealized and stylized picture painted by the poet in those lines of pale fire. Actually, it was idealized and stylized only in regard to the older woman, in regard to Queen Dissa, as she was that afternoon on that blue terrace. It represented a plain, unretouched likeness. I trust the reader appreciates the strangeness of this, because if he does not, there is no sense in writing poems or notes to poems or anything at all. She seemed also calmer than before. Her self-control had improved during the previous meetings and throughout their marital life in Zimbla, there had been on her part dreadful outbursts of temper. When in the first years of marriage he had wished to cope with those blazes and blasts, trying to make her take a rational view of her misfortune, he had found them very annoying, but gradually he learned to take advantage of them and welcomed them as giving him the opportunity of getting rid of her presence for lengthening periods of time by not calling her back after a sequence of doors had slammed ever more distantly, or by leaving the palace himself for some rural hideout. In the beginning of their calamitous marriage, he had strenuously tried to possess her, but to no avail. He informed her he had never made love before, which was perfectly true insofar as the implied object could only mean one thing to her, upon which he was forced to endure the ridicule of having her dutiful purity involuntarily enact the ways of a courtesan with a client too young or too old. He said something to that effect, mainly to relieve the ordeal. And she made an atrocious scene. He farced himself with aphrodisiacs. He farced himself with aphrodisiacs, but the anterior characters of her unfortunate sex kept, sex kept fatally putting him off. One more time. He farced himself with aphrodisiacs, but the anterior characters of her unfortunate sex kept fatally putting him off. One night when he tried tiger tea and hopes rose high, he made the mistake of begging her to comp comply with an expedient which she made the mistake of denouncing as unnatural and disgusting. Finally, he told her that an old riding accident was incapacitating him, but that a cruise with his pals and a lot of sea bathing would be sure to restore his strength. She had recently lost both parents and had no real friend to turn to for explanation and advice when the inevitable rumors reached her. These she was too proud to discuss with her ladies-in-waiting, but she read books, found out all about our manly Zimblin customs, 
and concealed her naive distress under a great show of sarcastic sophistication. He congratulated her on her attitude, solemnly swearing that he had given up, or at least would give up, the practices of his youth. But everywhere along the road, powerful temptations stood at attention. He succumbed to them from time to time, then every other day, then several times daily, especially during the robust regime of Harford Baron of Schalksbor, a phenomenally endowed young brute whose family name, quote, Knave's Farm, end of quote, is the most probable derivation of, quote, Shakespeare, end of quote. Curdy Buff, as Harfar was nicknamed by his admirers, had a huge escort of acrobats and bareback riders, and the whole affair got, rather got out of hand so that Disa, upon unexpectedly returning from a trip to Sweden, found the palace transformed into a circus. He again promised, again fell, and despite the utmost discretion, was again caught. At last she removed to the Riviera, leaving him to amuse himself with a band of eton colored sweet-voiced minions imported from England. What had the sentiments he entertained in regard to Dissa ever amounted to? Friendly indifference and bleak respect. Not even in the first bloom of their marriage had he felt any tenderness or any excitement. Of pity, of heartache, there could be no question. He was, had always been, casual and heartless. But the heart of his dreaming self, both before and after the, rap the rupture, made extraordinary amends. He dreamed of her more often and with incomparably more poignancy than his surface life feelings of her warranted. These dreams occurred when he least thought of her and worries in no way connected with her assumed her image in the subliminal world as a battle or a reform becomes a bird of wonder and a tale for children. These heart-rending dreams transformed the drab prose of his feelings for her into strong and strange poetry, subsiding undulations of which would flash and disturb him throughout the day, bringing back the pang and the richness and then only the pang and then only its glancing reflection, but not affecting at all his attitude towards the real Dissa. Her image as she entered and re-entered his sleep, rising apprehensively from a distant sofa or going in search of the messenger who, they said, had just passed through the draperies, took into account changes of fashion, but the Dissa wearing the dress he had seen on her the summer of the glassworks explosion or last Sunday or in any other antechamber of time forever remained exactly as she looked on the day he had first told her he did not love her. That happened during a hopeless trip to Italy in a lakeside hotel garden. Roses, black oracarias, rusty, greenish hydrangeas. One cloudless evening with the mountains of the far shore swimming. In a sunset haze in the lake, all peach syrup regularly rippled with pale blue and the captions of a newspaper spread flat on the foul bottom near the stone bank, perfectly readable through the shallow diaphanous filth. And because, upon hearing him out, she sank down on the lawn in an impossible posture, examining a grass comb and frowning, he had taken his words back at once, but the shock had fatally starred the mirror. And thenceforth in his dreams, her image was infected with the memory of that confession as with some disease or the secret after effects of a surgical operation too intimate to be mentioned. <laughs> 